Hi, I am Maria Tuckerlander. I gave a lecture for you called Contemporary Women's Speculative Fiction in Australia back in December, I think. And now I'm here to answer some excellent questions that have been emailed through to me. So let's get cracking. And here's the first one. Thank you for your very insightful lecture. Thank you for that positive feedback. Uh, your focus on allegory made me wonder how you feel about attention that is often discussed with regard to metaphor materiality dynamics. Does privileging allegorical readings sometimes gloss over the lived realities of some of the cultures that are narrated and their knowledge formations? And how does this pan out with regard to the novels you presented on? A great question. Thank you. When it comes to the text I analysed in the lecture, I think it's less a matter of privileging allegorical readings than undertaking the kind of allegorical readings that the texts demand. Uh, the Swan Book by Alexis Wright, for example, signals its allegorical nature in various and obvious ways, demanding an allegorical reading. The charge naming of characters, Belladonna of the Champions, in the novel is a classic means of inviting an allegorical reading. There's also the powerful motif of the swan, which demands interpretation. There's the dystopian non-realist setting, which invites uh, a reading of the text as doing something speculative and thought provoking. In fact, I would argue that it's through an engaged reading of the text as allegory that we come to understand what the text is trying to say about the lived realities of Indigenous people in Australia today and going into a climate change future. Uh, as I noted in my lecture, science fiction or speculative fiction and allegory are powerful modes for Indigenous writers in Australia. And I think it's in part because their enigmatic nature holds readers and their fantasies of knowing at a distance. These texts also demand to be engaged with as literature rather than as anthropological artefact. And I think the status of literature as literature, as something produced within a transnational and modern cultural com context, whether it's written by an Indigenous author or me, uh, is something we do have to keep in focus. Here we have the next uh, question. You argue that fantasy tries to distance itself from reality, that it systematically attempts to relocate itself as a form of escape and all world a text to the point that the exploration of its world is primary. How does that argument come to terms with contemporary fantasy? For example, uh, there's some titles mentioned there. Um, even in more traditional genre fantasies, as in the cases of works like some examples there, uh, we have many direct and clear connections to our world. Absolutely true. Is allegory then a method of reading rather than a genre distinction? I am pleased that I have been uh, called to task up and called to account a little further uh, for that crude distinction, I suppose, I drew between fantasy and speculative uh, fiction because it was um, broad or sweeping, a generalisation, I guess you could say. Um, and with regard to my comments on fantasy in the lecture, I was really talking more about the term fantasy in relation to my preference for the term speculative fiction, which for me implies the things I spoke about in the lecture, risk and ideas and real world relevance. And, and as to your question, you know, names of genres are important in part because they themselves signal or imply ways of reading. So reading a text as fantasy is different to reading it as speculative fiction or as allegory because the name fantasy implies a made up world. So there is uh, a form of reading that's implicit in that genre category. Um, although as sophisticated readers, we can certainly, you know, read, read for more. We can, in fact, read it in a speculative or allegorical fashion. 
But I hope I did also try to recognize that fantasy and allegory can often go together. I hope I did try to recognize that in the lecture. I think I made a reference to the Narnia novels as, as you know, quite a famous um, illustration of that. And certainly there are many examples of revisionary fairy tales and such that are doing work of real world political significance, uh, including the novels that you mentioned and others in Australia today. So I certainly didn't mean to demean the entire genre of fantasy in the comments that I made, um, but merely just to assert, for me, uh, the appeal of the genre title, speculative fiction. All right, I hope I've got myself out of trouble there a little. And question three here. It was a fascinating talk and I learned so much. Oh, that is great news. Thank you. I haven't read any of the books and I'm not an expert on speculative fiction, but I'm wondering about terminology. Although the notion of allegory seems to bridge the division between the real and the not real, I feel that there is still a rather binary division between what is perceived to be real and what is believed to be fantastic. I stumbled over the idea that speculative fiction is sometimes regarded as third world realism, and I was wondering how that is resonant of neo-colonial approaches to familiarise the unknown and make it transparent for a Western readership. At least it sounds a bit dismissive to me. Uh, well, that's an excellent, an excellent question. Um, and I can appreciate you stumbling over that particular reference to speculative fiction being interpreted as a kind of third world realism because I made that point so briefly and in fact with reference to my scholarship in the field of magical realism. And I was referring to the ways in which magical realist texts by third world or First Nations writers are often interpreted not allegorically but realistically albeit by well-meaning post-colonial critics, so that the political point or meaning of those texts is often in danger of being overlooked. Um, to provide an example of some relevance um, to my lecture, the magic in the literature of Alexis Wright has often been interpreted as providing an insight into the real magic uh, of Wanyi culture. However, as a result, the absurdity and irony and satire and parody and metaphor and allegory that often accompany those depictions of magic are overlooked in such a way that the meaning and nature of Alexis Wright's fiction is often misrepresented. So if we take a look at her earlier novel Carpenteria, for instance, which I believe, what it's worth, is her masterpiece, uh, the focus of many critics has been on its redemption of an Indigenous worldview. And yet if we look at the actual narration of magical episodes, they're so laced with irony and, and satire and, and parody and allegory uh, that to read them as a form of realism is a great disservice to this work of literature. Um, and there's also, um, I'll call your attention to an entire chapter, and I think it's called Number One, um, which is actually a parody of a, a classic novel in Australia um, by Tim Winton called Cloud Street, in which that novel um, claims primacy for a white Australian family who live in a residence uh, called Number One, Cloud Street. Um, Wright is clearly challenging that whole notion um, by putting her First Nations characters in, in a number one house. So the, the parodic work of that novel is something we really need to be paying attention to if we are to read um, that novel correctly, if we are to do it justice in terms of the literary work that it's doing. Oh, look, I won't dwell on, on further examples, but I have written... Um, about this kind of thing uh, so much in my scholarship on magical realism. So if you are interested in following that up, you're very welcome. All right, moving on. Question four. Uh, thank you very much for your great and inspiring talk, which I enjoyed a lot. I'm very pleased to hear that. And thank you for that positive feedback. 
It is a very timely and important project, and I'm fascinated by the ways in which you come to such a nuanced understanding of the speculative, which brings together various approaches in the field. My question relates to your understanding of the allegorical. Does the allegorical bear the risk of ignoring or glossing over the specific, imminent and particular, the situated and concrete, all of which are so important to the literary texts that you are discussing? Is it not important to take seriously the imminence of the depicted worlds instead of translating it into some kind of higher truth? Uh, quite a similar question to the first one um, that I addressed, and I would probably begin by saying that I think it's important to take seriously the work of the text, um, which is, in the examples I looked at, um, clearly signalling um, that it's doing allegorical work but it is, look, it's a long-standing concern about the allegorical and I generally have two things to say in response to it. Um, the first is that allegory, as I hope I um, persuaded you in my lecture, uh, is as engaged with the situated and the concrete uh, as realism. Um, in fact, one might argue, as I do, that it invites heightened engagement with the situated and the concrete uh, due to its deployment of enigma. So when we read allegory, we are constantly asking ourselves, what is this text doing? What is it trying to say? We're not able to take its speculative world for granted in the way that we might accept a realist representation. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that contemporary allegory, if we look at the examples, provided in my lecture, only stays in the realm of the abstract if we don't read it allegorically, which is to say, if we don't make those connections between the enigmatic text and the real world. So, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that an allegorical reading, uh, in fact, connects the reader to the situated and the concrete context, uh, which the allegorical novel is, is constantly in some way signaling. And I think that's as true of, um, you know, Gulliver Swift's, uh, Gulliver Swift, that's a good one, um, uh, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels as of the Swan Book. Uh, you know, so concluding um, response to this second last question um, would be, that I don't think we need to fear that allegory will lead us astray. Uh, in fact, the more passive reading invited by realism should perhaps be the more appropriate subject of our fears. Last question. Ah, oh, very good. In our discussion after your lecture, we ended up talking about the black swan in the swan book. To some of us, it read as an allegory for otherness being othered, but also otherness in context to blackness in particular. But then we also considered that black swans are, after all, native to Australia, so the connotation might be different for Australian readers. What is your take on the significance of the black swan? Well, they, they are magnificent birds. Um, but let, let me start by saying that I think Alexis Wright is the most exciting, most ambitious most complex writer working in Australia today. And I'm really pleased that you've been taken by the Swan Book, by the sounds of it, um, and the image of the swan as it transforms in the novel. I mean, that cries out with, with metaphorical and allegorical significance, even though um, the swan and oblivia are notably mute at the end. Uh, so that's certainly something worth thinking about. Um, for me, that po poignant ending um, with Oblivia sitting on the shore of the swamp cradling the black swan is in part a hopeful image of restoration or reparation. But Wright isn't given to sentimentality or easy solutions or, or happy endings. And that's because she's interested in the real. Um, and I think the image of Oblivia at the end of that novel with the swan then also speaks of the profound difficulty of recovery uh, for First Nations Australians, given not only the enduring traumas of colonialism, but also the future of climate change. 
which is continuing to wreak devastation on the traditional lands of Australia's First Nations peoples and therefore continuing to challenge their attempts to reconnect with their country and therefore with their identity. I mean, yes, the black swan is native uh, to Australia. Uh, the First Nations peoples are native to Australia. But what does it mean to be native after colonialism? What does it mean to be native in a climate-changed environment? I think these are really important questions that the novel raises for us to consider. Uh, well, I seem to have come to the end of things. There were five, five excellent questions for which I am deeply grateful. Thank you for engaging with my lecture so uh, rigorously and uh, I hope I have uh, done justice to these excellent questions in my responses today. Thanks again.